the Teaching Abroad Pod with James Davis. Hello listener, thank you so much for joining us on this very special edition of the Teaching Abroad Pod, coming at you on January 26th. I'm your host James Davis and with me this week will be my co-host Rowan from the Oxford Seminars Job Placement Service. Rowan, how is it going? It's going well, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, we've been looking forward to this one for a very long time. We're going to be speaking to a, a very special guest. Do you get? Have you got that Olympic fever running through you? Absolutely. I'm getting excited about it more so because of the guests we have today than the the upcoming Olympics. It's just such a fantastic uh, appearance on this show. Teaser, probably one of the most memorable Olympic gold medalists ever, at least uh, from my generation. Being Canadian, I resolved to enjoy winter sports, uh, getting out into the cold. There's really no other way to enjoy a Canadian winter. So, you know, I'm happy to be out skating, shooting pucks, downhill, cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, you name it. Uh, And probably because Canada's been more successful in winter Olympics than summer, coming from that smaller group of colder countries. I'm such a fan of the Winter Games. I grew up watching bobsled, speed skating, figure skating, curling, downhill, cross-country, biathlon, etc. But I think freestyle skiing and snowboarding were always my favorites, the ones I got the most excited to watch. I could watch moguls, ski cross, half pipe, stuff like that all day. Give me uh, as much uh, extreme sports as you can in Olympic Games. But I do have to say, I'm a little bit jealous never having been to a Winter Games myself. Uh, but you got to experience that, the last ones, live in Pyeongchang, South Korea. What was that like? What events did you see? It was amazing. Um, I, I don't have the, the rich history of, you know, being into winter sports because just not something that we're that into in the UK. But, um, you know, being out in Korea, you know, my wife is Canadian, so we decided, let's do it. Let's go to the Winter Olympics. So... We made a kind of long weekend of it. Um, the first thing we went to see was the skeleton. Because in inex- that looks deadly. I yeah. would be so afraid to do that. Inexplicably, it's the event that actually the team GB, Team Great Britain, does the best at. They seem to win skeleton medals. Everyone was so jealous at home that I was going to go to the skeleton, but it's actually not the best spectator sport because wherever you stand. You see, you see the person for less than a second, uh, but it turned yeah. out to be, it turned out to be the perfect event because um, it wasn't a GB gold, but it was South Korea's first gold. Um, the I forget the, the 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 guy's name, but he wore like an Iron Man suit, and he was amazing. So uh, you know, we got to see South Korea's first gold medal, which was amazing, and then. We took it a bit easier and went to watch women's curling, which Not is the best spectator sport in my humble opinion. Either I enjoy doing actual curling. I did that uh, you know, as an elective, as a, a an elementary school student, which I rather enjoyed. But uh, on TV, it's not my first choice. That's fair. I feel like the Canadian fans really got into it, like no other fan base. Like you could see. There was like, you know, a wall of spectators around and like the Canadian section was just raucous compared to <laughs> everyone else. They were seriously into their curling. Did um, you go to speed skating by chance? I, I know Korean speed skaters tend to, to be on the podium quite a bit. Yeah, so events like that were next to impossible to get tickets for. Anything to do with speed skating or figure skating, uh, you know, anything that's too popular in Korea, you, you, it was hard to get a ticket for, but curling, easy peasy. I remember when Yuna Kim was huge uh, in figure skating when I was in Korea. Is there, did they have any top level talent at the moment? Um, I think it was because Yuna retired, they retained the passion for figure skating, but I don't know that they had anyone competitive. The, the medal hope was all on the speed skaters. That mm-hmm. was massive pressure. That was such a big thing for, for my students and, and people getting excited about the Olympics in Pyeongchang. Um, and then the other great experience um, that doesn't happen at every Olympics, but I guess can happen 
you can apply for tickets to go to Canada House. So Canada House is like the hangout spot for Canadian athletes, their families to just, you know, hang out, watch the game. So um, as well as going to live events, we got to watch ice hockey in Canada House. And then an hour and a bit later, those same athletes were then coming through Canada House and, you know, seeing everyone. And it was a really good time. Ah, so you got to actually hobnob with the athletes. Yes, it was pretty cool. Uh, we got chatty with um, a downhill skiers family, and it, it was just a really nice, nice atmosphere. Um, and the best part was that it was, you know, bringing a slice of Canada to Korea. So, you know, we're eating poutine, drinking Molson. Like, that was nice, too, because, you know, it, uh, especially for my wife, who'd been away for so long by that point. That yeah, sounds that, awesome. Yeah, that has uh, stoked a, you know, a bit of interest in the Winter Games for me, and I'm looking forward to these. So for teachers currently in China, if you're able to get to the Beijing Games, that would be quite a memorable experience. Obviously, the best in the world competing at the highest level. Uh, sadly, it doesn't look like it's going to be easy to get to those games if you're not in China. So those of you that are already there really do have a very special opportunity that most people don't. Uh, having said that, I guess there is some debate as to whether these games should even be happening with the current state of the world. But the last, the, uh, the last summer games in Japan seem to have been somewhat of a success despite the challenges. So what are your thoughts on that, James? Um, I mean, I kind of want to look past the political side of things. I know that there have been um, some, <clears throat> some kind of protests diplomatically. Um, but in terms of competition and sports, I think it's important to keep the four-year cycle rolling. If they can do it safely in terms of COVID, personally, I think let's go for it because, you know, these, these events, they happen very infrequently for these athletes. So to keep that Olympic cycle going, I think is really important. Um, so if, if it can be done safely, it's a shame they can't be spectators, but from a competition standpoint, I, I think it should go ahead. Uh, what, what are your feelings? Yeah, I mean, I'm such a fan of the Olympics. I, I'm not going to, I haven't thought in great detail about my opinion on the games happening, to be honest, but if they're on, I'm definitely going to be watching them. So without further ado, well, actually with further ado, we are going to take a quick break. But after that, we are going to be interviewing uh the first gold medalist in snowboarding, Canada's hero, uh, anti-hero, Ross Ribliati. So uh, join us after the break for that one. With Oxford Seminars starting a new career teaching ESL couldn't be easier. Oxford Seminars has trained more than 70,000 teachers over the past 20 years, and you could be next. Their comprehensive 120-hour program starts with live instruction from an experienced ESL teacher followed by convenient online modules. If your goal is to relocate overseas or even teach from the comfort of your own home, Oxford Seminars' renowned lifetime job placement service will get you where you want to be. You can call 1-800-779-1779 or visit oxfordseminars.com today to find out more. Hello listeners, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Olympic gold medal winner Ross Rebliati to the podcast. Ross took up snowboarding as a teenager and went on to win both Canadian and American Amateur Snowboard Championships on his path to Olympic gold medal glory. Ross is the first ever Olympic champion in snowboarding, having won the inaugural giant slalom event at the 1998 Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan. He is also the founder of his very own cannabis brand, Ross's Gold. Ross, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, guys. Good to be here. So, Ross, you know, as someone who has... Never even stepped on a ski hill. Um, you know, how does one get into snowboarding? How does that all start for you? Well, uh, I guess it's kind of keeping up with uh, your friends and what they're what they're doing. Um, back when I was probably around fourteen, uh, a couple of my buddies ended up with snowboards, and the next thing you know, all I could think about was snowboarding. Is there a reason, because I, I know you were a very accomplished skier as well, weren't you? So is there something about snowboarding that just took you away? Like you, this was it, this was the, the thing for you? Yeah, definitely. I think 
you know, when I started snowboarding, it wasn't allowed in, in Canada yet, right? So it was kind of this fringe sport that was kind of edgy, you know, as a 14, 15 year old and in high school, I was a skater. And this seemed like a great way to like continue skating in the winter, right? And and we didn't even care that ski resorts weren't allowing it um, at the time. But the very next year, actually in '88, the first couple of ski resorts starting allowed, uh, starting to allow it. So yeah, it just went from there. And um, my my dad and my my parents basically weren't too happy that I quit ski racing because. You know how it is when you're like 14 or 15, you know, you're starting to look at the BC team and the national team and, you know, like with hockey, right? By the time you're 14, 15, you're on your way. So uh, to stop ski racing at that point for a sport that we weren't still allowed to do was a bit risky, I guess. So you're a pretty high level skier already at that age. Yeah, I was, um, you know, for a, a 14 year old, you know, and um on the ski team for several years already and uh traveling around for ski racing but then uh pretty much within the first um year of of getting into snowboarding i ended up getting sponsored and um my sponsor sent me like i don't know 10 or 12 boards wow nice lined up on the against the wall in the basement when my dad came home from work and i guess the the same light bulb went off in his head too because no ski companies were sending me 10 pairs of skis and like um, a pioneer almost getting in at the ground floor yeah this was a 88 yeah so it was quite the the ride up from you know around being 15 to 10 years later i was 26 and 1998 and so from not being allowed to snowboard and then 10 years later the trajectory that i went through um, first as an as an amateur um, in British Columbia and in the States and then being on the pro tour and, and also the World Cup tour from 92 to 99 you know it was quite the the build-up and even in high school you know I made the cover of snowboard magazines and uh, trans world I think it was like the fifth issue of trans world I'm on the cover of so it's kind of cool um, as a young guy in high school to be on the cover of snowboard magazine or it would be like being on the cover of thrasher you know if you're a yeah. skater just like insanity for a 17 18 year old and um yeah you just kind of me, rise. yeah it really did um kind of showed me a path and introduced me to some top level athletes like craig kelly who was world champion at the time and um you know i lived down in washington just near you know here and um I was able to get to know him and see what his path was. And I was like, you know what? He's got a house and he's got a sweet car and traveling around the world being a pro snowboarder. Why wouldn't I, you know, want to do that? So I just want to get in a, a quick self promo here, just from my hat. As you can see, Bowen Island. Oh, nice. Original. So I saw you're from Vancouver. I was born in Vancouver, grew up on Bowen for a bit. Have you ever been to Bowen? I have been to Bone, yeah, we're back in the day, dirt biking. Beautiful spot. I wish I was still there, but uh, sadly, I've I've come east to Ontario since then. <laughs> the land of opportunity. Is that what they call it? <laughs> well, if you're from BC, then then you know how expensive it is. I guess it's expensive everywhere these days, but yes. uh, it used to be the, you go out east to, to make money and you come out west for lifestyle. That's true. No one can afford a house in Vancouver. No one can afford a house anywhere anymore. <laughs> if you think Vancouver is expensive, go to Switzerland. Oh my, can't imagine. Yeah, yeah. But, um, and I actually have been, you know, on the World Cup tour for, for years and did actually live in Europe and um, had a pretty interesting um, slice of European um, culture. So yeah, I saw you were, you were doing pretty well on the international circuit for a while there. You were... Um second overall one season and third overall yeah. season after that yeah it was it was really um you know the experience of a lifetime obviously um a little bit isolating back in the 90s for lots of reasons like even at the time like aside from the fact that the internet wasn't on yet um the phone system in europe in the 90s was like non-existent like even some of the hotels didn't have phones you had to go down the to the post office to make a call 
And even then to get through to Canada from Austria is just complicated. But the whole um, tour, it was really like it allowed me to focus on, on snowboarding and, and my training. My first race on the World Cup tour, I got 80th, wow. right? And I was like champion back home, right? And so it was a huge wake up call and, and a big uh, learning curve for me to, I was just, I wasn't, I was almost not good enough to be there basically. And, um, but right away, visually, I was able to see very quickly what everybody was doing differently than I was. And I was on a pro team with, you know, a coach and setting gates and courses every day and riding with other top notch riders um, on my team too, traveling with them around the world. So within, you know, one year I made the podium, the next, I think the first race. So my first race of my first season, I got 80th and my first race of my second season, I got third. So um, that first year was a big learning curve. And um, actually in those early days, it was it was pretty intense. You had to be training pretty hard and and learning a lot uh, on the go. Sure. And and you know how like ski culture in Europe is like hockey culture and in Canada. And so when I got to Europe, these um, racing teams were like dedicated racing teams, like with coaches, whereas in North America, we just brought the race board to the race. There was no training for the race. <laughs> we just had a race board. That's what made us qualified to race it. And so, but in Europe, it was completely different. There was coaches, they would set courses five days a week. And then they show up at the race on the weekend after running courses all week, just like a ski team would. And so when I finally started training that way, you know, it was just a matter of, of hours on my board and, and running courses until I was able to you know, I was the first person to win the European Championships, and and uh, you know, I got a couple of uh, titles like the U.S. Open and Stratton U.S. Open Super G, Mount Baker Bank Slalom. I think in nineteen, that's a big race. I don't know if you guys know about that race, but no. Mount Baker Bank Slalom is probably the biggest race on earth besides the Olympics, wow. and um, it's quite the race. All the best guys come from around the world to little mount baker in washington and uh compete in this free ride competition down a ravine basically and they set the gates high up on each side of the ravine so you have to go up and just basically ride the tube all the way down and for whatever reason you know mount baker was already doing snowboarding in in the early 80s and you know craig kelly's home mountain and a bunch of uh top pros home mountain and over the years, it's just become one of these legendary, it's like the most legendary race, snowboard race. Awesome. So anyway, all those titles, you know, kind of, you know, I didn't win races every single year. Well, maybe I won one race a year. That was like the max, right? It wasn't like a given, like for sure, like which race it was going to be, you know, or anything like that. So, but some guys never made the top 30, like in my entire career, I know guys that never cracked the top, top 30. Just getting back to the abroad aspect, since we talk, talk a lot, obviously, about teaching abroad and living abroad, uh, did you have any favorite stops on the tour or places you just, like, you're always looking forward to being there for the, you know, the social aspects or the cultural aspects or anything like that? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, the the team atmosphere was was something that I liked and just traveling around to, um, you know, to the little villages in, in Austria and, and Italy and, you know, all, all of Europe, basically. I really enjoyed kind of like the downtime in between races or over Christmas holidays where I would like spend time in Zurich or drive up to Amsterdam and just go to Amsterdam for Christmas by myself. <laughs> you know, I was like 23 years old and in Amsty by myself. Getting big. Yeah, you know, and going to the coffee shops and experiencing, you know, what few people really knew about it back in the 90s. Yeah, so it was those sort of cultural like European experiences that really you know resonate with me and to this day like I miss a lot of the food and and just you know I'm fluent in French and so when I was there in in Europe it was nice to also in Italy or in Switzerland have to use French occasionally if they didn't speak English and then of course we had athletes coming from other parts of the world to compete on the World Cup tour too so we had like Russian athletes and Chinese athletes. And this was before the national teams. 
Um, this wasn't a government sponsored endeavor. These were athletes from Russia who wanted to go to the World Cup tour that had nothing to do with gold medals or, or government. And so they, they weren't they didn't have chaperones with them. Like we got to hear some stories about what it's like to live in other countries. And, um, you know, I remember being in, in Val d'Isere, for example, I think in around 92 or 93. And we there, there was a, a party from the from Bosnia that was there trying to promote uh, the fact that there was this big war going on just a few hours away from where we were racing. And if there was any chance that we could bring attention to that. And, um, you know, looking back on it now, you know, the, the story of, of Bosnia and, and, and the, Ser the Serbians and the, the, I, the whole conflict, like it was lost on us. We were just young kids, like 22, we no internet. We weren't like listening to French radio or like trying to figure out what the daily events were. And, but now it, you look back on it in retrospect and you see how, yeah, we were involved in quite a few things that we weren't, uh, you know, didn't realize. Awesome. So I just want to go back to the the competitive leap that you made. So you set, you started off like in the 80s, then you were winning events. Was that the point where the Olympics were on the horizon and then that became your, your big professional goal? Yeah, in 94. Um, so all along snowboarding was applying to the IOC to become a olympic event or an olympic sport but not until 94 did they announce to us that in 98 we would be a, a full medal event not even demonstration so we skipped being a demonstration sport and we went straight to um an event for for the 98 game so up until 94 we we had our fingers crossed i mean it was a big dream even to allow to get snowboarding allowed on ski resorts only a few years earlier than that for it to already get the attention of the IOC and for it to be an Olympic event and for me to have risen up and be ranked. I think at the time that we found out that we were going to Nagano in 94, I think I was ranked in the top three in the world at the time and instantly knew that I was going for sure, you know, for Canada, right? There was only like a handful of other guys in Canada anyways that, you know, were at that level. And, um, compared to Austria where they had like 20 guys that would be at that level. And so I, I knew I was going, but from that day on, so I, I started focusing just on my giant slalom and I dropped all of the other events that I was doing like slalom and just focused on my GS equipment and, and my training for GS. But then I got an injury the, that, that spring where I blew my ACL and, um, had surgery that spring and rehab over the summer. And it took me a couple of years to sort of get my form back um, to winning. Like I was still placing in the top 10 in World Cup, but to win, you know, you had to really push. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. So it took me a couple of years to get back from that injury. And and during that time, I, would, I didn't make the, the results that I was making, you know, the year before, like when I won the US Open and all the other races. So then I ended up losing sponsors, a couple of, couple of sponsors. And so leading up to Nagano, it was like a, a train wreck, basically. I got injury, surgery, you know, sponsorship issues, uh, team issues where I ended up leaving one of my teams, racing by myself for one whole entire season. And then when the national teams popped up for the Olympics, you know, then there was, there was somewhere to go. So I was, I got on the, the Canadian national team, but not right away. It was like kind of a lot of politics because the, the original tour of course was paying us to compete on the original tour and the snowboard federation fully thought that they would take us to the Olympics. But what happened is the ski federation got a hold of snowboarding not the snowboard federation and so then there was politics half the tour went over to the new ski tour which all of a sudden there's a new world champion that never got top 20 in his life so now there's two world champions and not all the best guys came over because they were winning big bucks and getting paid to, to compete on that tour like audi sponsored our tour right and we were not we're not just going over to the other tour and the other tour was all expenses paid whereas the pro tour was you pay to play and so the 
it was great for the, those guys because all of a sudden they had a free ride around the world and they were, it was amazing, right? Yeah, there was a lot of ups and downs from when we found out about going to Nagano until we finally made it. And so I ended up losing sponsors and I had, had some companies building me boards. And finally, we had a World Cup race in Whistler where it was going to be uh, Canadian qualifications. And uh, so we did that. World Cup was so-so qualifications. I was second. And then um, I was supposed to go to Lake Louise for more two more qualification races. And I was like, no, I'm going to Europe to compete against the guys I'm going to race against in Nagano. So I did that and lost, they, they lost my gear on my way to Europe. So first of all, I didn't do the qualification races that I was supposed to do. And then they lost my gear on the way to Europe. The whole World Cup tour by that time, like we were all traveling around the world for years and years. And so they all gave me a snowboard boots, speed suit, everything like let me enough awesome. equipment from all the different teams to compete and I ended up getting fourth in that race and then the next weekend in in Italy we we're in Switzerland then we went to Italy and race and I got third so I beat everybody that gave me lent me equipment but what was interesting is that the board that I used from my buddy from France from it was an F2 board was really similar to a board and that was my old sponsor that dropped me after my knee surgery and stuff like that. But I had won a lot of races on those boards and I had that board that I won the US Open on and the European Championships. It was custom made for me, right? And uh, I grabbed it out of the closet in, in, I guess, January of 98. And it was a board that was made for me in 1994. So it was quite a, a pick, right? And but the airlines lost all my gear, my boots, my boards, everything. And um, if you're a ski racer and that happens, like your career is over. Like you use the same boots for your whole career, pretty much. And um, be like a hockey player losing his skates, right? Mm -hmm. It was quite the quite the trip. But what what they what I didn't tell you was while I was in Europe before I did the first race of all the board equipment, my coach who had to go to Lake Louise for the qualifications said that they didn't pick me for the team Oh no! because I didn't go to the qualification races. So I was just like the worst night, almost the worst night of my life. Right. And um, anyway, so the rest is history. I got fourth, I got third. I wrote a letter with my coach saying, you know, that I had like a, an injury from that qualification race in Whistler and I'm sorry I didn't go. And yeah, it was just a series of ups and downs and and then right up until you know the race itself right like so for one thing the board that I grabbed out of the closet from 94 was feeling like incredible like never felt so good in my life on, on my board ever and so that was great because I was in Japan 18 hours of jet lag we have one day of training and then our race is the first event of the Nagano Olympics like the first day of the Olympics right in the morning first event of the whole entire you know, two weeks of the, of the games and uh, I'm running on empty, right? Cause I just was in Europe and then I came back to Whistler and then we, we flew to Japan, trained one day and then it's the, the Olympics and I'm running on European time still. Meanwhile, I've been back to Canada and right. So anyways, just like typical athlete uh, life. And um, yeah. And then from there, it was just a gong show after that. Um just leading up to to the the race because of all these things going on and the the struggle just to get there i mean obviously at the time it's not ideal but in hindsight is there any part of you that thinks that it was freeing like there was no expectation because of everything that had happened to you were you just like let's just go for it like i have nothing to lose or were you like i'm gonna get the gold the whole time um to be honest like i was i was from the minute that we found out we were going, I was going to win the gold. Okay. Like there was nothing about it. Like I lost, I didn't even sleep for the whole entire summer, basically leading up to Nagano. Um, I would think about it and my heart rate would go right up. Like if I just thought about it, my heart rate would go up. Um, anxiety, like just intense and anxiety, just thinking about it in July. Oh my God, I'm going to the Olympics. I can't believe it. like as a ski racer, I gave that dream up right when I was 15. Mm -hmm. 
and to, to start in snowboarding, like it was for, forget it. I'm just doing this because I love snowboarding so much. I'm not even going to go to the Olympics. So You're to re real, right. To re realize the opportunity to go to the Olympics was just outstanding. So it was, and I was at the top of my game, I, you know, one of the, the top racers, you know, on tour and um, the potential was there for me to win. And I knew it. So I ended up using that, uh, visualization like a lot to to train for the anxiety that I was going to have in the start gate so at first I tried to suppress the feelings and and then I started realizing like no let's bring it on let's try to think about it as much as you can and imagine what it's going to be like in the in the start hut and so I mean that's not an uncommon thing for athletes to to do but I really felt like the butterflies were like you want them to fly in formation, right? <laughs> you gotta guide them around and try it's to like take you're it. visualizing them taking you down the run. You do want that and all that energy. You totally. There's so much energy there that um, you do want it to sort of work in your favor if you can. I mean, the, the, what happens with that kind of energy is your muscles can freeze up like like steel, and you just like on the first bump you chatter off the course. And so, um, just just quickly wondering, after that big win, you were kind of a media darling for a while there. You know, you're on CBC with your interviews, you're on Leno. How did that feel to be like, in the spotlight after that? Yeah, it was it was pretty incredible. Um, I was I was a little bit um, or a lot distracted by the controversy of the whole positive weed thing. And, you know, obviously and then going to. LA from I, I literally flew from Tokyo to LA to do the tonight show with Jay Leno and right at the LA airport customs already had an issue with me and they weren't all they were already considering not letting me in to go to the tonight show but I was already like visually recognizable in Los Angeles by wow. by the next by the next day like I showed up at the Beverly Hilton that night and just tourists coming out of the hotel were recognizing me like you're the snowboarder you know from Nagano we just saw you on tv like two days ago or whatever it was and meanwhile I'd been in jail right like they they put me in jail you know and were processing me before because they took my medal away and then in between when they took it away and gave it back like I went to jail right they weren't gonna you're and then, actually in a jail cell in Japan in in Nagano and um not so, the most uh you know nicest accommodations i imagine no it was very anticlimactical and and um you know like the whole build up to get to nagano and like the boards and the sponsorships and not making the team and then having the positive drug test i mean it was bad enough that they were going to take my medal away but then like who ends up in jail like none other athlete besides me has it ever ended up in jail um even like steroids are illegal just like weed right okay so this is like out of control at this point I get my medal back I end up flying to LA and my life's totally you know changed and and um people like in America are recognizing me in Los Angeles like just walking down the street it was it's like from the depths to the heights all in a matter of a day <laughs> Yeah, but and then you end up with the, the supporters and then people who recognize you that are against the whole weed thing and, and the whole. And so as a young guy, right, like I, I'm the winner, I'm the Olympic champion in jail and I'm like the super popular guy. But then some people are like, you know, not not supporters. And, you know, we got um, letters at the time. There was no email, but we got letters in the mail, uh, some death threats to some fan mail, some not so fan mail. Yeah, we got fan mail and we got death threats, like all at the same time. And and so, you know, like in retrospect, looking back on it, of course, you know, it gave me a huge platform from which I could like get behind cannabis and, and explain to people like why I would as an athlete be using cannabis and, and, you know, why maybe other people should think about using cannabis and cutting out some of the other substances that people like to take on a regular basis well there's um, such a, a misconception about it in a lot of the world especially asia so here's a personal story i went and taught esl in south korea 
And when I was going there, they had uh, put a hiatus on drug testing. Drug testing is part of getting your alien resident card when you go to Korea. They put a hiatus on that. So when I got there and I needed to go get tested, I said to my boss, look, in Canada, it's pretty common. People smoke marijuana. You know, I happened to be at a party. I think I was, may have been even inspired by your uh, experience in a sense. I said, you know, I, I was at a party before I came. People were smoking it. I may have inadvertently inhaled it. So can you please make sure when they do the test, they, they don't do the, the cannabinoids test because uh, I would hate to be deported. That would be terrible. Yeah. And he was kind of taken aback and like, you know, oh, you know, that's, that's very bad. You know, we don't do that here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'd read that some of the hospitals are still doing those tests, but um, I was hopeful the one I went to didn't. And I don't know, I didn't get deported. So I guess either they didn't <laughs> ask for it or they didn't. Or it no came back negative. But I guess my question is, what advice would you have for people who are going to need to undergo a drug test for work or, or whatever reason? Well, it's a tough call. I mean, with regards to cannabis. Okay. Uh, it's not a hard substance to stay away from. Like, it's not addictive. It's, it's not physically addictive. It's psychologically addictive, like video games or TV or whatever. But um, it's an easy substance to not do if you do have drug testing at, at your work. And if you do, it's just unfortunate and you can get baked after you get a new job. Um, yeah, I think it's, I mean, I have, you know, for, um, I had a child custody issue with, with my ex-wife around 10 or so years ago, and she used the cannabis thing against me in, in uh, our divorce. And I had a couple of drug tests that were popped on me just you know, within a couple of hours, I had to take a test. And um, so I ended up using uh, one of those blocker drinks that you can get um, that blocks the cannabinoids. And two times it worked for me out of two out of two times it worked for me. Yeah. So anyways, I followed the directions on, the, on one of those drinks and two times and it, it worked for me both times. I don't think I was smoking as much but at the same time, I was because I was standing up for my rights as a as a person who uses cannabis and doesn't, you know, medicate with other substances. It's a, so, it's a big drinking uh, culture in Korea. And you'll see like, you know, businessmen out in the streets throwing punches after the bar. Like, mm -hmm. you don't you don't see the same kind of thing after a, no. after a bunch of dudes, uh, you know, puffing on the hillside or something. <laughs> Never, it never. And, you know, I've been to Japan like probably 10 or 12 times because our World Cup tour went to Japan every year. And um, also a big drinking culture in, in Japan. And I've I've stopped drinking probably going on four years ago now. But uh, back in the day, it was like the Japanese sponsors would take you out. And it was like, you know, sake and Asahi and all the like the they're good at drinking in Japan, right? And, you know, over time, I got good at drinking too and and um, found that it was just too big of a distraction for me. And yeah, I guess up about four years ago, I just gave up drinking altogether, half because it was just complicating my life and half because I was trying to cut weight um, because I'm a big road biker. And I'm like, what do I need to do? Like marginal gains is the whole the whole thing in, in road biking, right? Like same with with running like lighter shoelaces like anything you can do right to get you know your your watts up and I've I realized it was beer and just drinking in general that it was and it literally with my keto diet my training program and not drinking I dropped 15 pounds in like literally like in wow. like it was like a pound a day for two weeks like no problem just from stopping drinking and I do um, that myself from an athletic point of view and a dad and you know I've got three kids up until uh, 2019 I, I framed houses and um, trying to support the family and get the the Ross Gold cannabis business off the ground and you know going through like we legalized right so we're going through that whole process of legalization you know we had to shutter what we had going like I had a store in Kelowna and then when legalization came basically had to reboot all new partners everything was different yeah so it was just a matter of like survival and and for me just cutting out the things that I didn't need in my life like 
that weren't helping me in all aspects, whether it was being a dad or a husband um, or as an athlete. Uh, you know, I'm 50 years old now, right? I got I'm, I'm a little bit more cognizant of what my day consists of and, and how I want it to go and, and how I want the morning to be like and, and so forth. So narrowed down a lot of things and actually like got rid of a lot of shit too. Like just literally like possessions that I had just like. I remember reading an article where you said something along the lines of, you know, snowboarding and weed culture sort of maturing around the same time going from fringes to the mainstream. And I remember doing quite a bit of skiing in my youth. And often when you pass the train park, you see a bunch of riders just, you know, chilling on the hill, watching tricks, whatnot. Uh, did that often involve a bit of toking as well? Or was that you know, more of an off the hill kind of pursuit? No, I think, you know, the thing about weed is that, that you're not intoxicating yourself or um, what's the word that, that I'm looking for, but it, it doesn't it's not that's not affecting your your balance it doesn't affect uh, anything like that so really what when I use weed on the mountain which I love to do it just makes me more aware of my equipment um, where my bindings are how tight my boots are you know if my board's running fast or not or how my edges are feeling like it just gives me that extra little like sensibility about my environment that you don't necessarily think about when you know you're not having a puff on the hill and you know, aware. Because, yeah it kind of heightens your awareness right and especially like in the back country believe it or not like where you know you you might be inclined to drop in to a shoot just because your buddy did or or whatever but i found i find that with a with a puff and i use cannabis from morning till night so it's all day long but in the back country like you can really heighten your awareness and and you know what the dangers and and risks are it's not like uh alcohol where it kind of like dumbs that stuff down right like you get more aware i think on on cannabis and 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 so for me as an athlete it kind of helped me like dial into my equipment and my surroundings and what the conditions were like of course you know we're talking you know i'm referring to years prior to nagano right you couldn't go to the store and buy weed if you're an organ, you had to find a friggin' drug dealer you who sells somebody. Weed. You know, like whoever, like whoever it's gonna be, right? And then it's like illegal. You're in the states with weed. You're stressing the whole time, right? Like it wasn't a fun thing to have weed. You know, even in Canada at the time, if you had a bag of weed and you have to go through a roadblock, you're not even drinking or nothing, but you feel like there's a great white shark gonna bite your head off, and you know, when legalization came, it was like, oh, okay, this is like, Wait off I don't the shoulders. feel like I'm breaking the law anymore. You know? does, it, uh, does it disappoint you, Ross, that things haven't moved further with regards to, um, you know, being an athlete and, what, you know, being able to consume marijuana? Because it seems like, you know, every 10 years, there was you, then there was Michael Phelps, and recently Shikari Richardson. These things just keep coming up and, and, the culture just doesn't seem to have progressed. Do you think these bureaucracies just kind of need to wake up and see like there's some benefits here. You need to kind of relax on, on marijuana. Yeah, it is, it's disappointing and not a surprise at, at also at the same time. You know, I think if we go back to this summer with Shikari and the, the reaction and, and how the IOC is now reviewing cannabis since Shikari's experience, um, I think that you can boil that down to, you know, the loss of profits from Shikari not being at the Olympics and the amount of people who didn't tune in because Shikari wasn't racing, um, being the, the main factor behind them reviewing cannabis. I think that's unfortunate, but also fortunate at the same time. And it shows, again, that the top level athletes are using cannabis the best guys and girls, the best athletes are using cannabis, right? And they always have been because they know their bodies, they know how other substances are and, and you know, what they need to do to stay on top of their game, but also, you know, not lose their shit at the end of the day because being an athlete, not easy, right? the anxiety as well? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's good. Uh, it can help anxiety and it can add to anxiety. So it's a tricky slope with, with cannabis. 
personality types, I think, and character types have a big part of um, who uses cannabis. And so like for me, I, I find like I'm just too aggressive when I'm not on it. You know, I just I'll get in your face. <laughs> like I just find like as an athlete who I feel like I can win races, like I need the cannabis so that I can just like be nice and not walk around like an alpha all the time, like even when I'm getting my breakfast, right? Like that's interesting you say it. Um, you know, top athletes use it, it helps their performance in a sense. It's kind of new to me information. Uh, it reminds me of some other new to me information I heard way back when I went to a, a presentation by Mark Emery. I don't know if you remember Mark Emery. Sure. Uh, way back when a cannabis activist, seed oh, I know producer, him. et cetera. So he was at my alma mater at Carleton University giving a presentation. And one of the things he said, which I'd never heard anyone say before, cannabis makes your sex life better. He, he and his uh, partner could attest to that or something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Definitely it does. Yeah, especially edibles. For some reason, edibles is is great for that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's that's one of the the things, and they have infused lube and things like that. And um, you know, there's there's everything you know for sex and and cannabis to to come together. And you know, it really does kind of like let those you know mutual feelings and like that cozy thing to happen and and it's you're not like drunk right it's different you're like really appreciating you know the other person and their feelings more <laughs> and uh yeah no it's um there's a whole sensibility to, to cannabis that that goes beyond you know just making you feel relaxed i mean it, it does transcend in, into uh you know the bedroom for sure Sorry to put you on the spot there, but it just came to mind. <laughs> no, well, I do have three kids, so I'm guilty. Been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, right? So we've made you, you know, we, we've gone into detail about your past, Ross, and, and the journey and everything leading up to gold and since, but I wondered if you could just talk to us maybe about the future. So you've got Ross's gold and, you know, you're still an advocate for marijuana, so you know, what, what are your, what are your plans going forward? Well, my, my big focus is my family and, and mm -hmm. the kids and, and uh, what they're doing and they're all skiers and I'm busy every, you know, with them. I also am uh, a co the coach of the Apex Freestyle Snowboard Club here in, out of Penticton. And so I'm coaching um, kids on the weekends, uh, snowboarding and you know, I've got coaching certificates and qualifications and, you know, that can go wherever, who knows, maybe I'll be coaching the national team one day or one of my athletes makes it to the world cup tour or whatever. So that's, that's one, that's that. Um, and then I've got the Ross gold, you know, cannabis brand. I mean, it's alive. It, it exists. And I think I'm not rushing into the new, this new legalized, era that that we're in we did we we are into it like up to our eyeballs but um i guess we're just waiting and playing it out and seeing like who the players are and how like there's still the laws are still changing like this summer there's still some more provisions being allowed like farm gate where you can grow for your own store they haven't allowed that yet and so those are the types of things that i would be interested in getting involved in. I'm known as a, as a grower, master grower. I would, I don't call myself, I guess I did just call myself master grower, but that's what they call them. And um, so I, I'd like to see the day where I could have my own micro facility supplying my own store and then having like other micro and craft growers producing for me under a, you know, a Ross Gold Select. And then my own weed would be called the Ross Gold Private Reserve or Ross's Reserve, whatever it like is. Fine whiskey. Yeah, it really, it really is actually. And, um, you know, these micro cultivators and craft guys are really banging out some amazing product. But I'm not, we, we rushed into it 12 years, like in, I guess, 2013, you know, we really hit the cannabis scene hard and things were, there was a lot of speculation on legalization and where the medical world was going to take us and um so it's been 10 years that i've been you know actively pursuing the ross gold brand and and 
I think at this juncture where we've gone through enough to know that we don't need to run to wait. We're just going to like sit back. The brand exists. It's building in popularity, like by the second, even without having a product for sale. <laughs> it's incredible. I got stores from Nova Scotia DMing me on Instagram, asking me where, when am I coming out with another batch or where can they, you know, get my stuff anyways. So that's kind of, that's, that's where it's going. Of course, I want to, I'm, I'm into like car racing and I just got invited to Romaniacs and, and Romania to, I don't know if you know what Romaniacs is, but it's a crazy uh, dirt bike race, cross country dirt bike race. So yeah, just lots of cool extreme sports opportunities. And I'm still big into skiing. And um, so I'm coaching the snowboarding and at the same time, I'm like waxing my powder skis. So oh. God. Quickly, James, for before we wrap up, I know we've kept you a long time, Ross, but I'm curious. I saw there's a there's even a run at Whistler Blackcomb called Ross's Gold. Do you ever go on that run? Yeah, I do actually. And um, what's it like you being know, on a run a, with your name on it? It's a great run, and and the reason why we I chose it and they gave me the choice is because that was the run that I trained on a lot, you know, leading up to Nagano, and um, the trees on the right of my run are also incredible. So in case you're at Whistler, Black, it's all in Blackcomb and it's a powder day. Check out the trees on the right. Awesome. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it's great. Uh, Black, Whistler has been a huge uh, supporter and over the years. And yeah, I look forward to going there every year. Well, uh, thank you so much, Ross, for you know sharing your history and leading up to the Olympics and and, you know, going into a little bit of, of what that experience was like. So we just want to say thank you so much for your time. And uh, we look forward to seeing what the future holds. Awesome, guys. Yeah, well, thanks for having me and for thinking of me for your show. I appreciate it. Hey, oh, if you're off time. to Romania, we'd love to hear all about that, too. <laughs> oh, man, if you can talk my wife into it, I'm going for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, guys. All right. Good day. Care. All right. Peace. Thanks again to Ross for joining us today. What a fantastic guest. Thank you, listener, for tuning in to the Teaching Abroad pod, where we'll be releasing new episodes every other Wednesday. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe and share it with your friends. Remember, you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, anywhere that you can find a good podcast. If there's anything you'd like us to discuss or any other gold medalists that you want us to talk to, let us know. Uh, you can send us a comment on YouTube and you can find us at Oxford Seminars on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. Failing that, you can even email us at teachingabroadpod at oxfordseminars.com. Have a wonderful day and I hope you enjoy the Olympics. <laughs>